Okay, we're um, now into our third hour, and we've had a, a very uh, interesting array of speakers and topics from around the world. Um, my longtime friend, uh, Dr. Mary Ruert, is the chair uh, of the, Liber of the Inter International Society for Individual Liberty. Uh, many of you may know her from uh, uh, your activity or her activity in the Libertarian Party. Uh, many years ago, uh, she was a candidate for president and um, uh, narrowly lost a couple times, actually. But she's been a speaker at uh, Libertarian events around the country, uh, largely on the basis of her, uh, her articulation in these meetings, but also in her book, a uh, very, very well-known book called Healing Our World uh, in an Age of Aggression. And it's a very uh, good book. I give it to many of my students who are uh, primed for a very good, thorough understanding of free market ideas and ideas about civil liberties uh, uh, around the world. And uh, also she's written a book called uh, Short, um, answer, short, short Answers to the Tough Questions. Uh, how to deal in the argument with people about various issues and topics. Um, she has uh, also been on the, uh, the National Committee for the Libertarian Party for many years and knows all about the inside politics of that uh, organization for a long time. Um, and I found her one of the most effective uh, speakers, especially on topics of uh, this on uh, the Food and Drug Administration. I was so impressed. I had her speak to my students in my classes uh, one uh, time, when, a couple times when she's been visiting in Hawaii. And um, she gave an astounding story about her research into the calamity of uh, the disastrous effect of the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, so won't you welcome Dr. Mary Ruert. Well, thank you, Ken, and thank you for all for being here. We really appreciate, uh, we really appreciate your help here. And uh, I'm going to be talking about the FDA, and many people say, well, you're you know, sponsored by the International Society for Individual Liberty. What's international about the FDA? Well, I guess you could take the theme of our conference, which is Rome, and remember the phrase, um, as goes Rome, so goes the world. Well, as goes the U.S. pharmaceutical industry, so goes the world too, because about half the drugs are discovered here in the United States. They don't always come first to our market, but they are discovered here. So if something interferes with that, and we're going to be talking about how the FDA does just that, it not only influences people in the U.S., but ripples outward to influence people in countries all over the world. And in fact, as you'll see, it's not just about pharmaceuticals, it's about prevention as well. So let's talk a little bit about what we almost had, a golden age of health in the 1960s. We were really poised on the brink. You know, it used to be that the number one cause of death in the world was infection. In the early 20th century, that's what people died of, and they died very young sometimes. We just didn't have anything to stop it, but antibiotics, better sanitation, and other advances that helped our bodies become strong really eradicated that. So, you know, we had really conquered the number one killer by the 1960s, and vitamins had been discovered and were starting to really be appreciated. I remember when I was a child, the first one a day multiple vitamins came out, <laughs> put out by the pharmaceutical industry, by the way, because they had actually developed ways to synthesize or make the vitamins, which may not be the preferred way, but it's better than not having them at all. And so they were making vitamin C in large quantities, some of the B vitamins, vitamin E. Now these became available to people. And of course, with our current lifestyle, we need a little more than maybe we did before. Or maybe it is that the optimal vitamin intake is a lot higher than just what we need to survive. That's what we were sort of discovering about that time. And every year, we had between 30 and 39, roughly, what we call new chemical entities hit the market. Now, a new chemical entity is basically a truly new drug, you know, as opposed to 
putting it in a liquid instead of a pill. So we were starting to make some pretty good advances on the pharmaceutical front. And of course, these new drugs and probably the other things that we were learning were saving a lot of lives and money. But in 1962, we have the Keith Hoffer Harris Amendments passed. These were amendments, these were laws, regulations about the FDA that had been languishing in Congress for a couple of years. But because the biggest drug tragedy of all time, thalidomide, had hit, uh, the American public was saying, let's you know, have something to you know, make sure this doesn't happen in America, because it happened primarily in Europe. And what happened was that there was a new sleeping pill put out on the market called thalidomide. And it was actually safer than the barbiturates that were used at the time. You know, a lot of people were dying of accidental overdose of barbiturates. But when I say it was safe, it was safe for adults. It wasn't so safe for the unborn child. And what had happened is women had started taking it and realizing that it helped their morning sickness. So they began taking it, and the manufacturer began promoting it for um, you know, morning sickness. And unfortunately, if taken in the first month or two of pregnancy, it often uh, caused a condition that created um, the loss of a limb, like an arm or a leg, in the newborn. And so, of course, this was very tragic. There were about, about 10,000 babies born in Europe that had this problem. There were a few in the U.S. because the drug had just started undergoing testing, but not too many. Now, the problem with the Kefauver for Harris amendments is that they wouldn't have prevented this tragedy because it was mostly caused by the fact that at that point in time, we really didn't appreciate, at least not at a very um, universal level, how much more sensitive the unborn baby was to drugs than the mother. Had we known that, of course, we would have tested, and today we do test for it. So what these Keith Hoffer Harris amendments did is they demanded that there be very stringent effectiveness testing for drugs. Now, of course, as a consumer, we would say, yeah, that's a good idea. We want to know the drug works. But the fact of the matter is that many drugs, well, all drugs work if you count the placebo effect. Every drug will work in people who believe it will to some extent. And then, of course, what does it mean to be effective? Does it have to work in one out of 10 people? Or does it have to work in half the people or 90% of the people? And how much does it have to work? Does it have to work a little or a lot? You see, it's very hard to define that. And of course, there had to be FDA, what we call guidance in the industry in animal testing. When I say the industry, the pharmaceutical industry is what I'm referring to. I was a pharmaceutical scientist for almost 20 years, so I worked in the trenches here and had a chance to work with the FDA. What this FDA guidance really means is you better do it or the FDA won't be happy. And then, of course, the FDA had to sign off for approval. It used to be before these amendments, the drug companies would give their information to the FDA. And if the FDA didn't say anything within a spec specified amount of time, then you could market the drug. It was OK. So unless they objected to something, you could market it. Now somebody had to sign on the dotted line. So if anything went wrong with the drug, if it had side effects, and all drugs have side effects, let's face it, then this person could be called on the carpet by Congress and be given um, a hard time for approving a drug that had side effects. Really put the FDA in an impossible position because there really is no drug that's always effective and always safe, but the FDA was supposed to approve only those types of drugs. If it had done that, we would have no new drugs today. And of course, the FDA had oversight of advertising and labeling. When you watch those advertisements where half the commercial is about the side effects of the drug, that's because that's what the FDA requires. That's part of it. And the thing is, you can't say something works unless the FDA has looked over your data and agreed. And as we'll see, that put a major, major um, barrier in trying to prevent disease uh, from supplements and other nutritionals. And of course, the FDA got to now oversee manufacturing. One of the first things it did, it inspected all the pharmaceutical plants, and half of them were put out of business by this inspection. Uh, the plants were not necessarily given time to bring up to the FDA standards. And so, of course, this started the creation of what you're seeing today, which is a real conglomeration of the industry and, and a concentration into just a few 
big manufacturers. Well, what did this do? Well, this graph basically shows you in the blue bars that you see in the beginning of the graph that between 1948 and 1961, the time it took from a, for a drug to be made and taken to the market was a little under five years. It was about four and a half to five years. And then after the Kefauver amendments were passed, which you see in red, the time to get uh, a drug to market increased by 10 years. You see, the Kefauver Harris amendments were really kind of open-ended, so every year the FDA just added more and more regulations, and the rate, uh, the, the time it took to get a drug to market kept increasing. So we've added, by the end of uh, the 1990s, we had added about 10 years to the drug development time. Now I can tell you that some people have diseases that don't let them wait this extra 10 years, and here I'm thinking of the AIDS patients. In the 1980s, when our company started working on AIDS, by the time the FDA gave us permission to put our new drugs in people, every AIDS patient in the country that wanted them had already had them and developed resistance. You might ask, how can that happen? Well, the AIDS activists went out and hired black market chemists to make the very drugs we were working on in violation, of course, of the FDA and patent law and distributed them throughout the AIDS network with actually very good safety records. They kept track of what happened, they told people what the risks were, and it was a really remarkable operation. You can read about it if you want to in uh, Jonathan Quitney's book, Acceptable Risks. It's a very good book. I highly recommend it if you're interested in that subject. Well, obviously, this is a big problem. And it became such a big problem that eventually U.S. Congress had to extend the patent life of new drugs because the companies weren't making enough money to stay in business. Uh, the number of new chemical entities per year dropped by about half. And in 1984, they passed the Waxman-Hatch Act, which extended the patent life for some drugs. Um, I'm not big on patents myself. I don't think the industry would need them except for these regulations. But even Congress admitted that 84% of the drug development time were due to regulations. That's a pretty big admission, and it's pretty scary, too. Now, let's take a look at what this increased development time does on the cost of getting the drug to market. Well, as you expect, it would increase it. So if you look here on this graph, and you see the little white squares down there in the bottom, um, those are the, those squares represent the amount of money it took for a pharmaceutical company to invest in order to get a new chemical entity to market. That was the research and development cost. And you can see the line extrapolated out to a little more than the year 2000. You can see that it was way under $100 million um, in 2003 dollars if it had continued that way. But of course, it didn't continue that way because the Kefauver Harris amendments were passed. And so, as you can see in the dark squares, the prices uh, that the, or the costs, I should say, that the pharmaceutical manufacturer had to pay in order to get a drug to market increased uh, pretty much exponentially and was up to about $500 million in the early 2000s. That was the actual expenditure. The capitalized expense was about a billion dollars. So it's a lot of money. It made it very hard to recover costs. In fact, uh, we'll hear some stories later on about what that impact was on innovation. So. As you might expect, since you know economics, if you're at this uh, meeting, at least I assume you pretty much know that if it costs the manufacturer more to produce something, you're gonna pay more at the pharmacy. And sure enough, as you can see in this graph, basically we're showing that um, as the cost to the manufacturer goes up on the x-axis, the cost to the consumer paying at the pharmacy goes up. In fact, it's a pretty strong correlation. Um, and you can actually calculate how much this increased is. Sure. It looks like 10 to 1. Yes, actually, I'm going to tell you what the number is in this next slide. Um, for those of you who don't like looking at graphs but just want the bottom line, uh, if the pre-amendment trends had continued, we'd be paying about 15% as much at the pharmacy as we do today. 
It's huge. It's huge. And, and you know, we might be willing to pay that if, if it really made our drugs more safe. But the problem is most unsafe drugs that get to market do so because we don't know any better, just like with thalidomide. We really didn't appreciate at that point in time how sensitive the fetus was. And that's what's happening today. You know, we do tests on people, of course, but it's a small population, so when it gets out into the broad market, what happens is genetic differences, environmental differences, make things cropped up that we didn't really expect. I mean, that's the usual. I'm not saying there's never any fraud, but the usual scenario is that we just didn't know any better. So unfortunately, these amendments don't address those problems. And you know, we can actually estimate how many people would have died without the amendments because we know how many uh, drug-related serious injuries that we had between 1950 and 1962. And you can kind of extrapolate that out to what it would be, you know, in the next, uh, I think I did this up to 2003 when I started this, and it would be about 7,000 lives that, that the amendments might be saving. And of course, now we take more drugs in this country, we take multiple drugs which interact, maybe this number should be 10 times as much, or even 100 times as much. I mean, you can, you can play with this number a little bit, but what I'm gonna show you is even if you multiply it by 100, this number pales in comparison with the number of people who have lost their lives waiting for life-saving drugs to get to the market. Let me show you. Because we know how long it took drugs to get to the market before the amendments passed, and because we have studies that show what the drugs that are on the market um, do in terms of saving lives, we can actually calculate and just the bottom number in red is all you have to look at. 4.7 million people have died prematurely between 1963 and 1999 because of the amendments. That's a lot more people than the 7,000 or 70,000 or even 700,000, depending on how you want to think about it, of the number of people who might be saved by the amendments. So, you know, that's, that's really huge. And we're just beginning actually to talk about that because, you know, if you look at the loss due to innovation, it's even bigger. And, you know, it depends how you calculate this loss, but we've lost at least, that's the conservative number, at least 50% of our innovations. And, of course, during this time, what was happening is Europe hadn't changed their laws very much. So, at least initially, they hadn't. So Americans got new drugs later than Europeans, and sometimes not at all. That situation has changed. Now Europe is imitating the US. So it's happening everywhere. It's rippling out. Now I want to talk about a personal experience I had that really gives you a good example of how this innovation is lost. I actually got a call from the FDA examiner in my section, which was gastrointestinal. And this FDA examiner was very excited. He said, Dr. Ruard, I understand you just filed a patent for the use of prostaglandins in liver disease. I said, yes, that's the case. He said, well, I'm really excited because 100,000 people die every year of liver disease and we have nothing to treat them with. So I want you to know we're going to work with your company as much as we can to make sure this gets to market. Well, of course, I was, I was excited. I thought this meant something. But the problem is that the FDA has such a high standard to meet that it's very difficult when you have a new drug. Because, for example, we didn't know what dose of the drug to give. We didn't know how many times a day we had to give it. We didn't know how long we had to give it. I mean, liver disease takes years to develop. How long did we have to treat people before we could see a change in their disease? And how did we look at that change? Did we take a liver biopsy every time? Mm, not a good idea. Did we look at some blood parameter? Well, there hadn't been any developed yet. We would have had to develop that. So there were a lot of unknowns. And what we figured out is if we didn't guess right the first time and do the study to show the big difference, what we call a statistically significant difference that the FDA likes to see, we'd have to start over. And if we had to do that, by the time the, the, the drug reached the market, it would go generic the first day, and we would never recover our costs. 
So that's how a lot of innovation is stopped at this point. Because the costs of regulation are so high, it is very hard to get especially very new innovative things to market because the cost is usually larger than the averages that I've shown you here. So it's, it's very disturbing. And you know, that loss of innovation costs us a lot in other ways too. You know, and that's because, if you think about it for a moment, take the example of Tagamet, the first anti-ulcer drug. Back when I started, the solution to ulcer disease was surgery. Ah, you had to spend 25000 on the surgery. You had to be out of work. And you know, this was, a, this was a big problem. There are risks to surgery. You might die. But when Tagamet came on the market, for one or two thousand dollars for one or two years, you could take this drug and get rid of your ulcer. That was certainly a bargain, even though it was a high-priced drug at the time. It became the number one selling drug in the world, and it saved a lot of money in healthcare costs. So, you know, we're not just talking about lives and money, although I'm going to share that with you now. Um, you know, if you think, for example, that these lost innovations are just as effective, would have been just as effective as the drugs currently on the market, you can see at the bottom line that about 16 million people have lost their lives because of these lost innovations. If you think they'd only be 25% as effective, about 4.1 million would have lost their lives. We're talking big numbers from innovation, innovation loss, and I didn't even do an estimate for what if these drugs would be more effective than the ones on the market today. Obviously, that number just gets bigger. Now, it may seem to you uh, as if I'm being hard on the FDA, but I just want to remind everyone that I'm really talking about the changes in the FDA that happened because of the Keefe-Hoffer-Harris amendments. And ironically, the Keefe-Hoffer-Harris amendments really demanded that drugs be safe and effective. And yet, they, by any standard of economic measurement, appear to flunk those criteria themselves. So it's a little bit ironic. Unfortunately, I have just really begun to tell you about you know, what this means to our healthcare system, for example. The loss of innovation probably accounts for 8 to 30% of today's healthcare costs for the tagamets that aren't there. Um, there's a delay in getting drugs to market that's got a cost to it. Uh, there's an increase in pharmaceutical prices. Well, you kind of get the idea. So, you know, the bottom line is probably 25 to 55 percent of our health care costs today are due to these regulations. And you know what? I haven't talked about the big one, and that's nutrition, prevention. You know, um, when I started, I wanted to, I found out that B vitamins actually uh, prevented alcoholic liver disease, and I went to my uh, supervisor and said, why don't we just suggest that we put B vitamins in alcohol? And he said, oh, can't do that then it's considered adultered. In other words, you know, poisoned or, or not pure. <laughs> so that had already been ruled ineffective. And unfortunately, there was a very inexpensive treatment for um, neural tube defects, which is a birth defect that puts babies into institutions usually. And it could be prevented by the B vitamin folic acid. But because it was a vitamin, it couldn't be patented and so the drug companies couldn't recover their costs if they developed it, and the FDA said, you know, you can't talk about this. Even when the Center for Disease Control was trying to tell young women, take folic acid to prevent birth defects that happen early in your pregnancy, they told them they couldn't do it. Yeah. So, you know, probably about 25,000 U.S. babies were institutionalized because of this, many more aborted. And fish oil is another one. You know, fish oil for many, many years, uh, it was shown to be very effective in heart disease. One company finally decided to try to jump through the FDA hoops, did so, and um, now is the only one that is legally allowed to go to doctors and say, our fish oil has been approved by the FDA. Of course, the copay is as big as if you got fish oil from Walmart or some other place that had the exact same thing. So that increased our cost, too. Well, I could go on. And of course, as a research scientist that made her animals sick by taking away their vitamins in order to get a disease model to work with, I know how very important this is. And I'm just going to say very briefly, because I'm running out of time, that there is uh, an international movement called CODEX 
to make vitamins prescription items. It's happened in Germany, so the vitamins that you can get legally there are very low. And unfortunately, um, these, these numbers are so low. For those of you who take supplements, I'm sure you're aware that at least 10 times that amount is, is probably optimal, maybe even more in some cases. So in concluding, I just want to say that our golden age of health was compromised by the FDA. We have fewer life-saving drugs, longer waits for them. It's a dri driving new technology like stem cells offshore because the FDA is claiming that if you take stem cells and culture them and put them back into a person, they're drugs. Since there's no way for uh, a doctor's office to patent that and, and go through that development program, it's been driven, driven them offshore. So we have higher health costs, less access, and of course the biggie is that we have gone from a model of prevention, which we were just coming to, to treatment, which is not as effective. As they say, a pound of prevent, or uh, yeah, an ounce of prevention <laughs> is worth a pound of cure, and it certainly is true. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope that you'll stay for the rest of our panel and questions. Thank you.